In the financial world, fintechs are taking over the world. The U.S. has witnessed uh, unicorns in the form of Robinhood and Stripe, while the EU has seen the rise of open banking. And in parallel, mobile money is taking Africa by storm. It seems as though every day there's a new innovation in financial technology. However, there's a new player on the scene, a player that promises and looks forward to total financial inclusion. A digital bank by the name of MyMonty was looking to make a global impact on finance. And today, Inside Telecom is happy to host Mr. Charles Metta, the VP of Growth and Strategy at Monty Finance. Mr. Charles, it's wonderful to have you here and thank you for being here. Could you briefly tell us about yourself as well as Monty Finance? Of course, thanks a lot Yahya for having me and thanks for Inside the Telecom. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to be here and uh, for you to have uh, to give me the opportunity to showcase the proposition and the new venture that the group is, uh, is uh, going into. Um, so as, as you've said, you've mentioned my Monty, you've mentioned Monty Finance. There are as well other kind of projects related to fintech, including Monty Pay as well. Uh, so uh, I just like to introduce a bit uh, uh, the group. The group has been in the market for more than 20 years now and been a tech company that's been very well known across the globe. So a tech company cannot just stay behind and, uh, and look into the digital age. So this is why we've said, no, it's, 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 it's something that we have to act upon. And this is why we've launched our first fintech product two, three years back, which is a virtual credit card in partnership between ourselves, mobile operators and banks. Uh, this is the first fintech product in terms of specifically uh, financial technology oriented that the group has ventured and piloted the market in. And uh, after that, we were kind of expanding the strategy to make sure that we offer a full spectrum of financial services uh, that's definitely uh, offered based on the different arms that we've built. Uh, so Monty Finance is the digital arm of uh, the whole group. Underneath it, we have My Monty, as you've rightly mentioned, and Monty Pay for the time being. Monty Pay is a global payment gateway. It facilitates payments for the merchants, so it's a B2B business model. And in parallel, we have My Monty, which is an AO bank that's offering a proposition of a B2C uh, that is uh, a full spectrum of financial services, starting definitely by a minimum viable product and expanding into a very exciting product roadmap as we move forward uh, in, 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 the, in the venture. So everything that you've said, I want to take a little bit of a focus on MyMonty because recently there was a couple of news releases coming out uh, that, that MyMonty is looking for partnerships specifically in different markets. And could you, can you tell us a little bit, can you expand about the forms of partnerships? What kind of partnerships are you looking to, to have with MyMonty and Monty Finance? Yes, of course. Uh, you know, the new world is, is, is built on partnerships, yeah. but that's something that we piloted uh, years back. You know, we have a, never called the mobile operators that we deal with as suppliers, clients, vendors. These were, uh, from the beginning, our strategic partners. And now, as the digital age is shaping the customer's expectations, uh, you know, people are looking into more and more and their expectations are growing at a faster pace than any standalone entity can ever afford. So accordingly, partnerships is, is, is increasingly been known in the market because you can partner and leverage on the potential synergies that different players in the market have and they commonly share to offer a one-stop shop. So this is why what we're doing in terms of our strategy, in terms of the first direction that we're starting from, we're starting by our vision. You know, the vision, the uh, digital front, the proposition, and the target segment. Mm. So who's our target segment? Our target segment is unbanked, underbanked, underserved. Wherever these people are, this is where we will be. And this is the promise we made, and this is the promise that we will keep on making for the people to say that we're going to Latin America, we're going to Eastern Europe, we're going to the Middle East, and we're going to Africa. So this is the, the country definition and the drivers uh, is, is, is a both a quantitative, qualitative, and the fact that we cannot just stay behind and look for it. So that's in terms of definition of the countries. Uh, and, you know, venturing a country isn't easy to do it on your own. And this is why partnership is an important thing to look, to look after. What kind of thing do we expect from partners? It depends on the type of partner we're, 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 we're talking about currently. Uh, you know, unlike what's commonly known, uh, the conventional banks, the licensed banks, are the first strategic partners for fintechs. You know, a fintech cannot process without a bin sponsor. 
cannot process without a card management system. And there, there are a lot of international market players that we have to leverage on to potentially uh, leverage on the synergies that we both have to be able to offer the customers uh, a product that suits and meet their expectations. Uh, you know, partners, uh, uh, I'm gladly, uh, you know, announcing that we've, we've, we've finalized a strategic partnership across the European economic area. Uh, that would allow us to go uh, live very soon, uh, hopefully. Uh, and we're, advanced, we're in advanced discussions with multiple partners in the region, including Africa and the Middle East. Uh, for sake of exclusivity, are you at liberty to say who are these partners or who are you negotiating with? Uh, uh, to be honest, there are a lot of partners. It's yeah. not just that I don't, I don't want to disclose that, yeah. but that's going to be disclosed and announced in, in due course. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the launch is very soon, and that's something definitely we're, we're proud to announce and to declare. Okay, that's brilliant. So within the announcement, uh, it was mentioned that there was, there's going to be advanced AI features as well as technological features. Can you paint us a roadmap as to how these features will affect the, the user experience? How will, it, uh, how will it put you as a leading player within the market? Can you expand a little bit on the technologies used within MyMonty? Of course, of course. Uh, you, you know, yeah, yeah, it's uh, the, the new fintech proposition, Neobank's products are all built on artificial intelligence, on blockchain, on uh, 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 big data, cloud computing. All of these affect the Neobank's products and not just the Neobank's, all the fintech players. So basically, that's what we're leveraging on because you cannot just build a customer-centric approach without a specific and very advanced artificial intelligence engine because you have to understand what the customer is looking forward to, to be able to tailor your proposition and tailor your product roadmap to specifically what the customer is looking forward to. So this is what we're starting from early beginning. So it's not like we're just kicking that off once we go live, no. It's that we've been working for months on defining the parameters that we need to, cap to be captured by the AI modules that uh, they have to capture all of the consumer behavior from day one uh, to make sure that these customers are satisfied with the specifically tailored products to them. I'm glad you mentioned customer-centric approach because theoretically and on paper, it's, it's known that traditional banks have a one-up over neobanks, such as, such as what MyMonty is looking to achieve, which is basically a tr uh, customer trust and funding. So based upon that, how will, how will MyMonty look to bolster this customer trust in order to have a, as successful go-to-market strategy as possible? Yeah, that, that's 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 an excellent question. Actually, I, I'd like just to, to 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 talk about further about trust. What is trust? What's the definition of trust? You know, trust is a. I just compare it to a to a bank account. You know, a, a, a number of trustworthy activity considered as a deposit in your bank account, mm -hmm. a number of activities that you do uh, uh, would be considered as withdrawals. So your balance would be affected by the number of activities that you're doing and the perception of the people about these activities. Mm -hmm. So I cannot just simply compare the trust level of the public uh, that they have about conventional banks with fintechs. Mm -hmm. Conventional banks, uh, they have been in the market for centuries. So the number of activities and the volume of activities that they've deposited in that the account of trust uh, is much more than the fintechs. Uh, but if I'd compare, and just to be fair, if I'd compare the level of trust that the public has for fintechs compared to the, the level of trust that the public has for the conventional banks, I'd say in a relative comparison and in a very fair uh, comparison that the fintechs uh, have managed successfully to gain the trust of the public. And, and this is proven, you know, when uh, the, the first players started in the market, People were just, you know, like transferring uh, $20 into their account that they have in a, in a neo bank, and they just subscribe into uh, uh, a certain, uh, yeah, yeah it's, do some transactions exactly. in it. Uh, but but if, if, you'd, if you'd follow the trend, you'd see that the average volume of deposit has increased over time. That means that the trust of the public has increased. And this is something that we cannot, you know, like, like, uh, like disregard. It's, it's an increased level of trust by the public. But definitely, definitely, I cannot, I cannot just 
you know, uh, uh, hide behind my finger and say uh, uh, trust level of the fintech is, 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 is higher or lower. But I'd say definitely it depends on the target segment. You know, it's, it depends on the age bracket. It depends on the uh, uh, economic level. It depends on the country. It depends on the specific niche. Uh, some players might find uh, they, they, they have more trust to transact on a fintech platform. And some others would say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm more comfortable to transact in, on a conventional bank, on a licensed bank uh, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of platform. But the message that I want to relay today is, is is not a competition. It's the public. It's the people that they need all of our efforts just to make sure that we offer a very centric approach and a very good proposition that meets their expectation in partnership with uh, uh, existing banks and in partnerships with the different players, whether in the fintech space and the whole ecosystem. Okay, so looping and emphasizing a little bit on that point, specifically when it comes to the approach. As you know, currently, when it comes to financial technology and when it comes to any kind of user, they like to relate and work with and be customers of brands and companies that they can identify with, that they can see the culture, that they can see the organization and see that this is a company they want to either give their money or to work for or to work with. So based on the approach that you just mentioned, how will that be integrated within the company's general strategy as well as the work culture that's being given? Yeah, that, that's, that, that's, that's a competitive advantage, I'd say, just to go back to one of the questions that you've, you've asked, Yahya. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, we're, we're a startup uh, in spirit, but we cannot, we cannot forget that we're leveraging on a, a very strong group that's been in the market for so long. Um, definitely a monolithic approach is adopted by both groups, and that's inspired by our chairman, Mr. Hashim. Uh, you know, it's... it's it's, it's leading, leading by example. Yeah. The culture that's been uh, in uh, the whole Monty Group is specifically translated into Monty Finance, which is an agile culture, which is an non innovative culture. And this is what matters today. You know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not being innovative means that you're going out of the market. Yeah. There are a lot of examples. I, I, I don't want to mention examples. Uh, uh, you, you know, just speaking about players that they filed for bankruptcy, uh, uh, that they failed to innovate. So innovation is, is I, I say, the first uh, uh, driver that drives all the world culture. You know, being, being there, uh, 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 every manager is there for his team uh, uh, to engage them, to motivate them, because in that specific culture, you'd be able to, uh, being, to feel engaged and to give your maximum and to innovate, which is the most important thing. Uh, that's from a world culture perspective. But you know that uh, proposition uh, in, 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 in substance should go with the world culture and should meet the world, world culture at a, certain, uh, at a certain point in time. And this is a competitive advantage for fintechs uh, uh, in general, is their agile uh, uh, core banking system and the technology that they are using. You know, it's, it's not layers over layers. It's a microservice proposition that they can directly tailor uh, in, in, in line with innovative products, innovative uh, changes to keep on changing and to keep on tailoring and catering for customer's expectation, you know? It's, uh, if I compare customer's expectations 20 years back and how they change over years, uh, you'd see the pace of the changes is drastically uh, uh, at a higher pace in, 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 in I'd say, the post-pandemic. Yeah. Uh, so we, we, have, we have to deal with that. We have to deal with that proposition, and we have to be innovative, agile enough, and our technology to be able to cater for this proposition. I'm glad that you mentioned uh, Mr. Mr. Hashim, very innovative man, very straightforward and truly a leader. But what I want to ask with, with regards to that is, can you tell me a little bit about the name? Why is it called My Monty? Like a little bit of speculation and something behind the logo as well. Can yeah. you provide us with a little bit of explanation? Definitely, definitely. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, we've, been, we've been all over the media for the past couple of months. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you people, were asking this stuff, huh? the yeah, couple exactly. of weeks ago, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And people started to ask, what is it about the logo? What is it about the name? And exactly. so on. Um, uh, you know, we, we have to leverage on the success story that this man has built over years, Mr. Hashim. Uh, so uh, a monolithic approach between the whole group, Monty Group and Monty Holding, has been adopted with Monty Finance. If you can see the, the, you know, the pattern of the Monty existing all over the place. 
Um, so so w we've started by that because it's a success story that we cannot we cannot forget, and no one can forget uh, how, how, how it comes to the internal house. So we're here to leverage on that and to leverage on the success story. So this is, this is from where we started. And then we've said, who are our target segment? So we're, we're, we're targeting uh, underbanked, okay. underserved, that they uh, feel more confident to partner with something that they feel belonging to, that they feel they own. And this is from where we started with the my. So my Monty is, 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 is a possession of a whole success story in the hands of these people that they represent our target segment. Uh, so this is from where it all started. And when it comes to the compass as a logo, it means that we're going everywhere uh, and we're available wherever uh, the, these customers will be to drive the financial inclusion, you know, and this is this is kind of the story, and definitely there are a, a lot of rationale for that. But that's at a at a high level, briefly, what's behind the logo, what's behind the name, and 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 uh, and the success story again that we have to leverage on for Mr. Hashim. Okay, steering a little bit sideways. Um, according to recent reports, the neo banking industry uh, will look to hit approximately three hundred and thirty three billion dollars by twenty twenty six, and with most of them servicing SMEs. So could you briefly tell us about Ma Ma Monty Finance's strategy when it comes to SMEs, how are looking to service them, work with them, and help them out to their entrepreneurial uh, success to, to foster innovation wherever they might be, specifically when it comes to the emerging markets that we were talking about earlier? For sure. No, no, that's, that's, that's a very fair question. Uh, I'd, I'd like to go back and just speak about the target segment. Okay. When I said underserved, yeah. underbanked, unbanked, I didn't mean specifically individuals. Okay. So it's individuals and companies that they were financially excluded. Mm. And that, that goes without saying that uh, SMEs are part of these companies that they were struggling to expand due to lack of financing, that will, due to lack of being financially included in the system. Mm. Uh, just to speak a bit about the product roadmap, we're starting by uh, definitely retail, individuals okay. as a start, but as a rolling out procedure or, or strategy, a business account is on the product roadmap in a very short period of time. And that's definitely targeting the SMEs because SMEs are real to help economies and countries. Right, they're the backbone of every economy. Exactly. And how they're going to be able to do that without uh, being uh, or riding uh, the digital wave. And that's been offered by two things, just not to focus on uh, just the neobank proposition. You know, our payment gateway is, is, is speaking and talking to uh, these SMEs uh, with the e-commerce, with, uh, uh, with, with all people just sitting in their houses and just want to order things online. How these SMEs would like to uh, uh, expose their products to these people without the proper, properly channeled payment gateway. And this is why the payment gateway is on the loop. This is MontiPay. So we're connecting these people to their customers through a, a payment gateway, which, which started this operation very recently, actually. And at the same time, we're offering them a banking proposition for them to be financially included as part of the neo banking proposition. So we're trying to kind of uh, uh, make sure that the proposition is comprehensive, is, is complete for these uh, companies to make sure that they go, expand, and definitely benefit the countries that they operate from. Deviating a little bit, uh further. As you may know, and as anybody in the tech scene knows, that governments have been rather sluggish when it comes to regulation, specifically when it comes to tech and fintech, and we've seen a lot of plunders everywhere. Thus, in your opinion, how can uh, these fintechs, these private companies, and the private sector as a whole, help governments in, in regulating the industry, the market, specifically when it comes to neo-banking? Yeah, that's, that's totally fair. You know, it's uh, governments... Uh, I'd say there are two types of governments. Okay. You know, governments that they were walking through innovation mm -hmm. just hand in hand with new players, okay. and governments that they were observing just to, just to understand the proposition, just to know how they're going to react to it. And there are a lot of examples, you know, look at Mexico. They've started very reluctant, and now they, they, they are 
kind of walking hand in hand with new players. You know, we're, 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 we're talking about regulatory sandbox for these new players to test the market, to do the first sprint, the second sprint, test the market, check consumer behaviors, make sure that the proposition is really intact from risk compliance to make sure that the FinTech has ticked all the boxes for the regulator yeah. and in the same time for the regulator to be comfortable. You know, if we look into regulators, if we look into regulations, we see regulators a bit reluctant, but, yeah. but everyone is a bit reluctant to change. Everyone is resistant to change. Uh, some governments, uh, uh, they were exposed to uh, more innovation in, in, in specific places, and they are more welcoming this innovation and, and, and helping, helping achieve this innovation. You know, like, talk about the open banking in the UK, uh, talk about the PSD2 in Europe. These are all regulations that they've helped the whole ecosystem improve improving uh, to make sure that the proposition is much more convenient for uh, uh, the people. Um, I, I just speak about my, my, my recent experience, you know, Dubai International Financial Center. I was going to bring up Dubai because recently, there was, there was, yeah, like not long ago, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that said that Dubai has become a playground for fintechs and innovation, becoming a cradle of innovation, primarily because these tech leaders, these startups, these, uh, these uh, ventures are walking hand by hand with local regulators, testing the markets, as you said, using them as a sandbox to improve the quality of their service and to meet the, the needs of the market. Do you think that this approach, when it comes to Dubai specifically, do you think this, is, this can be applied to other markets as well? Or do you think that it's not a one-size-fits-all, it's a case-by-case -case study? To be honest, I, I say that model can be easily replicated. Okay. You know, Dubai, the UAE in general, ADGM, the IFC, Dubai International Financial Center, uh, they've, they've all been very uh, 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 welcoming to innovation. And th that goes with the, in, in, in line with the uh, vision of the leaders of the country, you know, hosting the coders, hosting the developers, uh, making it an innov innovative country, you know. And, and just speaking about my experience, uh, the regulator is there for you. You go, meet with them, discuss the business proposition, discuss the business model, and define it hand in hand with them for them to tailor the regulation specifically to fit your proposition. Uh, I'm just specifically talking about the UAE because I live there. It's just, it's just because I've, I've recently experienced the discussion with uh, uh, Dubai International Financial Center, the DIFC. Uh, you know, they, they, they make you feel comfortable. You know, they, they want to help you. They want to uh, 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 take your hand and walk with you to tailor specific regulations that ticks all their boxes yeah. to make them very comfortable with the proposition and at the same time, make sure that the innovation is there and, and the, the products are innovative to a very high extent for them to lead the market. So if all the governments around the world would take that approach, mm. We were looking into a different world in 2025. Of course, since, since, as you said, when they do that approach, there's the regulation on one side that is catering to that financial technology or to that technology as a whole. So the regulator is getting what they want. And in parallel, the, 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 the company is providing their services within the regulata regulatory framework that the government is providing. Exactly. So it's, it's a win-win. Exactly, 100%. Exactly, 100%. Because, you know, innovation is inevitable. We, we have to go with it. Uh, we, we have to live with it and we have to foster it because that's where the world is going. And this is where we should moving with it because we cannot just uh, 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 say in a couple of years from now that uh, uh, you know we, we've 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 lagged behind. You know, so a lot of players that they've built on their brand equity, and because they had a very strong brand equity, uh, and they just uh, tried to penetrate the market a year or two years after innovative products have reached, and they failed, and they filed for bankruptcy. And governments should uh, be very aware of that because. Government is, is the territory where, 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 where all these uh, uh, fintechs are, are, are operating and it's the whole ecosystem. So if the ecosystem is not, ho is not hosting these fintech players, the territory or the country would, would lag behind. Of course, of course. So you heard it here, everyone. A lot of people should take notes on how Dubai is doing their business and the UAE in general. Thank you, Mr. Charles. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for giving us the information right here on Inside Telecom. 
Thanks a lot, Yahya. Thanks for Inside Telecom and looking forward for our next uh, uh, interviews. You can follow us on Inside Telecom social media pages, which will appear on the screen. And if you want more in, in detail, in-depth reviews of financial news, technology, AI, and everything in between, especially when it comes to telecom, visit our website. The link will appear in the description below. Thank you. Have a great one.